All right. We're talking Colts football on the Our Lads Football Network. That means Ken Sterling is joining us from the Ken Sterling YouTube channel. How's it going, Kent? It's going good, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And so we only have now, uh, well, our time is uh, limited regarding free agency. The tags were just released. Pittman, obviously a big name on that list. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the program. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of fans want to know what's going on between free agency and the draft as far as what the Colts are going to be looking for to upgrade the team. So let's get right into that. All right. So the Colts depth chart uh, is now available for everybody to see as we go through. Um, and of course, this is rlads.com, the best depth chart uh, in the industry for the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, before we get into the depth chart, uh, I want to uh, ask you, Ken, about uh, overall, where is the team right now? Uh, what kind of coaching changes, if any, uh, key coaching changes, if any, did they have any offseason? And how uh, does the how is the cap situation and overall front office uh, at this point? Uh, the front office is completely static. Like No changes in the front office. It's still Chris Ballard at GM, Ed Dodds. And, and Morocco Brown kind of as his lieutenant. I think the scouting situation is very, very similar. Position coaches, they went out and got a new D-line coach. They felt like they needed an upgrade over what they had. I think similar to what they did the year before where they got Tony Sperano Jr. to run the offensive line, which was a huge upgrade for, uh, for the Colts. So that okay. offensive line really kind of found their enthusiasm again yes. for one another and for that for what they're trying to get done. So, uh, but for the most, they've got new assistant secondary coach, Mike Mitchell has left Reggie Wayne's back as a receivers coach, um, linebackers, Richard Smith back. Ron Miles is the primary secondary coach is back. The offensive staff, uh, as far as the coordinator, Q QB coach, all of that stuff. Uh, also, uh, very static. So okay. kind of same old, same old. They're coming off nine and eight. They, they want to get to the playoffs. And I think they feel like they've got the staff that they want to be able to get that done. All right. Uh, and then th there's definitely enough money for the Colts to be able to take care of business, especially on defense with their two biggest uh, needs as far as to bring back Buckner and Kenny Moore. You know, it, 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 Stewart is, is a Stewart, guy who's off the yes. book, books at 10 million. And uh, then they'll, I, I think they can re sign him for the same amount. I think Kenny Moore is kind of a $7 million guy slot corner. And so that's where they've had him at. They've got about 70 plus million dollars in cap space. Um, had that until the franchise tag was applied to Michael Pittman Jr. Yep. Now they're in the 50s, uh, but you can go get more if you want to get more. You can cut Mo Ali Cox, who's a uh, a nice piece is a tight end, but you can go get six and a half million to the good uh, with with uh, Mo being cut. And then okay. Ryan, you can you can probably rework his deal, sign him to an extension that's more cap friendly and, and get some more money yet. But, you know, with 50 plus million dollars to spend and and the clock ticking on Chris Ballard, he, he's won one playoff game. He's gone to the playoffs twice has never, I don't believe, I don't think they hosted a playoff game in 2018. That was a road game against the Texans. So this is a team that hasn't had the postseason success that Jim Irsay would like. And I think the heat is starting to rise with uh, with Chris Ballard. And so maybe, maybe this prompts, I don't think it will, tell you the truth, but maybe this motivates Chris Ballard to, to get aggressive in the first week of free agency a time that he has traditionally kind of sat out and yeah. let everybody else make mistakes and overspend. <laughs> yeah. um, Ballard is, uh, you know what, in some ways it's a positive, in some ways a negative, but he is intractable. He believes what he believes. He believes you build the roster from the inside out, and he believes that stupid money spends in that first week of free agency – um, we'll see if the fear of losing his job kind of motivates a change in that ideology. 
Yeah, because you, uh, and we'll get into this as we take a look at the roster. There's you can see it. You can see the the the, the college free agents. You can see the late round draft picks. A lot of uh, inexpensive players that are found uh, because of really good scouting, but they're also very cheap. But you don't win in the NFL without stars, and that's what you're alluding to. Is that yeah? You may have to overpay every once in a while, and maybe this is the off season. He's got to do it at least with one. A star type player. Absolutely. And it, it, you got to take a chance. I mean, if you don't take a chance, if you play poker and, and you just, you check and you check, and you <laughs> yeah. check, fold, check, fold, check, fold, it, your, your stack of chips is going to be reduced very, very slowly. You know, you, you're, you're just fiddle farting around and that's kind of what the Colts have done. They've fiddle farted and Chris Ballard will not go, you know, he's not pushing his chips into the middle of the table yeah. with anything but bullets. And, and that's just kind of crazy. At some point, you got to take a chance or you wind up nine and eight, eight and nine every single year. Yep. And yep. that's really what the Colts have done, minus that four and 12, four, 12 and one year, two years ago, and the initial year uh, with the Colts at whatever they were in 2017 when he was really trying to put this back up on its wheels. Um, they have been very mediocre. They did have on the positive side 11 and five back in 2020, catching lightning in a bottle with Philip Rivers. Yes. So they did get that done. But Ballard on the whole is risk averse, and the results would bear that out. If there was a marquee player that you could see the Colts signing, and Colts fans are out there. They're come on. Who is it? Who, Cause I'm sure there's rumors all over the place right now. Cause there's names out there. Give me a name that you can see them signing. I got to tell you the truth. I don't see one at all. Really? Uh, Not even like a Justin Simmons. Simmons. I think you let uh, maybe ex uh, Xavier McKinney comes off the board as a safety. And so you're left in week two. It's Geno stone. You, you go out and do something like that. I, okay. They're not going to sign a wide receiver, a veteran wide receiver, a star level one, because what happens, and, and Ballard knows this better than anybody, that there's a reason why these guys are free agents. True. You know, they're they're not they're not perfect players, or their teams would have re-signed them when they had the opportunity. You've got to figure out why these guys are free agents, and a lot of times when you pick that scab. You, you find something that is, or I guess that might be the wrong metaphor, but you, you know, you look, you, you look into that yeah. box, you take yeah. a peek and you see why, you know, nobody's buying that cheese. It's got some mold on it. You know, I mean, it's just, that's the way the NFL is. Nobody lets a dynamic elite level player go unless they've got some serious, serious flaws that are really, really difficult to, to compensate for. So uh, I think they go safety in free agency. I'd love to see them go after, um, you know, if, if there was a cornerback on the board, but nobody lets a great cornerback go. Nobody nobody lets that happen. The The hope is, and, and the thing that really pissed Ballard off about the NFL bumping up the salary cap by $20 million is that the Colts were in a position <laughs> to grab guys that are being dispatched by other yeah. teams. And you see the Chiefs, they're trying to pare back their cap number, the Bills, uh, the Broncos. And so guys are being uh, the Giants a little bit. You see guys on the street that normally wouldn't be on the street. And that's where Chris Ballard makes his living. Yeah. But that $20 million bump in the cap, that kind of – that took some of those guys off the street and will allow the originating franchise to re-sign. All right. So – because, yeah, so every once in a while, you are going to find a player. And again, I don't have any idea. I haven't looked into it yet. Why Justin Simmons, besides money, uh, with everything going on with Russell Wilson, was let go. And and, and if that's right. the only reason, then there's that small percentage of players that you have to try. Oh, OK, well, maybe there isn't really anything that's wrong with him. Maybe it is the fact that the NFL is going away from high price safeties because of the way the game is being played. And so maybe we have a bargain here and a marquee name. But again there's really not many players out there like that. So I, I totally understand what it is that you're uh, alluding to. And this is the right, this is the, this is the way that Ballard has run his uh, business so far. So. And you know. the, the perils of running your business in that way, it's that you better hit in the draft. Yeah, that's true. 
Like um, if, if yes. you aren't going to sign big name free agents or take yep. a chance on them, you better hit on every single one, every single two, and go like 50-50 on all the three. You know, like let's say 50 plus. So top yes. 50, you better you better knock it out of the park <laughs> or your franchise is going to suck. Well, speaking of uh, uh, collateral, draft uh, capital, uh, what is the situation right now for the Colts? You got all your picks. Everything. They okay. have every single pick, one through seven, that belongs to them. And uh, they have no additional picks. They haven't swapped out and, and bulked up. They've got their pick, one through seven. And so you've got, in the first three rounds, you got 15, 46, and 82. And, and we'll see what they're able to do with those picks. But you ought to be able to do something. I think, you know, Ballard always says that 15 is sort of where the shelf is. And I think that this year, this kind of a deep draft, especially at positions where the Colts would like to do some business at 15, yep. so I think they stick with 15. And then at 46, I think you can likely get somebody who, who's decent. I mean, we've seen... We get all agog over wide receivers who are projected in the first round, but you're just as likely to go be able to get an elite one in the second historically yep. as you are in the first. Yep, and this is going to be a very nice draft for picking up receivers rounds two, three, and four. So um, even more than normal. Okay, so uh, let's talk then about uh, offensively. Let's start with uh, Minshew. Does Minshew return, or is he gone? They're, they're just not because uh, somebody out there is going to offer him a pretty decent contract, I would guess. I think they'd love to bring him back, but the way Gardner Minshew sort of described his attitude toward it, he wants to go to a team where he's going to compete for a starting job. You know, he's been around the league for a while, and it's time for him to do that if he's going to be able to do it. So I think that he's going to try to find a place where at least he's on equal footing or at okay. least being allowed to compete for the job. And in the Indy, that's not going to happen. Steichen loves uh, Gardner Minshew. I asked Shane Steichen, he did media earlier this week, and I asked him what he looks for in a backup quarterback. And he kind of described Gardner Minshew to a T. He said that he wants a guy who can come off the bench without practice reps because you're not going to get any reps with the one ones. You're going to run the scout team. That's right. And so you got to have a guy who's going to be able to come in and operate that offense, which means to me, you're not going to draft as much as I'd like to see them take a little bit of cover in case Anthony Richardson is just kind of made of glass and, and can't stay healthy at all. Sure. I, I'd like to see them take a guy maybe in the second, like Bo Nix, if he drops to 46 but he's not a guy you're going to be able to plug and play. He's going to have to learn the offense from jump street. And then maybe in year two, year three, he'd be able to be that backup. But right now, not be able to fill that role. So I don't see the Colts making that kind of move in the second as much as I'd like to see it. So, and you think they'll be uh, comfortable with Ellinger as a number two? No, no, oh, I think okay. they'll sign a free agent. I, I think okay. they'll go out and sign somebody. I don't okay. know. Like it, it wouldn't, it, you know, Tyrod Taylor is not going to make anybody really happy in Indianapolis and Jacoby Brissett. We've been down that road before too. Um, there are free agent quarterbacks available that can kind of fill that role. Yeah. I don't know. Like, of course, none are going to be, none are like, wow, we got that no. guy because no. starters, you're not going to get a starter to be your backup. So that's kind you of know, where they're at. Yeah, there are a couple of guys that could be intriguing, and that would be like younger guys that uh, have starting experience, like a Drew Locke, uh, maybe even a Zach Wilson, guys that you're talking about that, hey, you know what, they're not going to go out and get a draft pick, but somebody that can come right in and they can start and they have experience. Matter of fact, um, we, I wanted to ask you, I'll bring that up because you were talking about, well, it's hard to find good free agents because yeah. why are they available? Well, that does not mean that Ballard can't swing a trade. 
And that's where you wind up. That's where you can find good players that maybe don't have as many awards because they're not being let go in free agency. They're good players that teams don't really want to let go, but maybe they have to because of budgetary reasons or there's just uh, issues with the depth chart. There's somebody blocking somebody. So uh, maybe that's where uh, Ballard can make a big splash uh, in acquiring somebody, not necessarily a backup quarterback, but any particular player through a trade. You know, and he's done that. He did that with DeForest Buckner, where he traded 13th overall and and signed him to a long term deal. Um, so he's not averse to that kind of thing. He yep. he knows what the team's needs are, and you're exactly right. He may choose to do that. That that always upsets. I don't know if it upsets me, but that's a lot. Like DeForest Buckner needed to be really good to justify 13 and paying $20 million. You know, the, the good thing about having 13, or in this case this year, 15, is that you get that guy under your control at a really low number for four years. You know, and, and to sacrifice that, the quality of player that you might be able to get yeah. at 15 in order to go get a guy without the warts, without the flaws, but you pay him real money to come in uh, like that – you better be right. And fortunately, Ballard was with Buck. Yep. All right. Uh, let's now talk about, because I'm looking at this step chart and I'm not, I spent on offense and I'm not seeing a lot of major changes that are going to take place. I mean, no. you do have Zach Moss that they have to make. So do, do, do you think Moss comes back or no Hull will move in as the number two? I don't think Hull's going to move in at the number two, but I think you're going to be able to go out and get the next Zach Moss. Okay. You know what I mean? Like they traded Naheem Hines, they got Moss back. You know, they uh you you can make a deal or you can sign a free agent or you can draft a guy in the fourth round who they drafted Marlon Mack back in the day in the fifth round. Yeah. And Marlon Mack was a serviceable starting running back. And and that's why, I mean, you know, the the market for running backs is depressed. Yeah. Because you can go get these guys. <laughs> you know, if if you've got an offensive line like the Colts have, they're going to be holes. And and so you're going to be able to go out and get a guy like Zach Moss who can run through them. Evan Hull's an interesting guy, though. I, I think he's more a change of pace guy coming out of the back backfield and, and catching the football. He was really good at that as he played at Northwestern. Yep. And I think he would have given – I don't think that the Colts lose that game against the Texans if they've got Evan Hull out in the flat trying to catch that ball from Gardner Minshew – instead of the guy they did. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, not a memory Colts fans want to remember. No. Uh, yeah. Leaving the biggest play of the season. Uh, and it's not fair to leave the biggest play of the season to a player that is not even anywhere near the top of the list, as far as players that uh, you would expect to get the ball in big moments. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you think Moss will, uh, leave? Do you think he's going to wind up going somewhere sort of like Minshew? I want to go somewhere. I'm going to get more, uh, playing time. Yes. Okay. I, I like Zach Moss, all these guys, we don't talk about it all together too much and they don't like talking about it. These guys are businessmen and, and Zach Moss wants to be a, a starting level running back and he wants to be compensated as a starting level running back. And, and the time to do that in his life is right now. He's got to maximize his earning potential, and he's not going to be able to do it here because Jonathan Taylor is the bell cow. He's paid to be the bell cow. He will always be the bell cow. And so, Zach, you know, if, if he wants to come back and get seven carries a game, I, I guess he can. But I don't think that that's what he's looking for professionally. All right. Woods, a uh, tight end. Uh, he was lost for the year, but everybody else uh, and Woods, uh, as of right now, are ready to come back. So how do you see this room going? Because we were talking on the other video, which you can, by the way, we'll have a link in the description of this video of where you can get. Uh, we have a condensed uh, uh, segment where we go over the top five needs for the Colts. And you brought up uh, well, what if like a Brock Bowers were to slip to 15? Um, look, we pr that probably won't happen, as you said, but there's always going to be one, maybe two players who will slip. It happens yep. every year and they're good players. It's just it just happens. So but let's just say that doesn't happen. Um, what do you see the Colts doing with this tight end room and how do you rank this tight end room? Oh, 
That you know what? If, if you could combine these four guys, <laughs> yeah, you leave right. Ogletree out of it. If you could put all these guys together, you'd have a Travis Kelsey or a George Kittle. Uh-huh. Get open, make the catch, get yak. They could block. They could hold the edge. They could do all the things that a tight end's got to do. But as individuals, each of them has a flaw that is is really hard to compensate for. So they shuttle these guys in and out. Yeah. And maybe Woods, if he could stay healthy, like he was on his way to coming back. He had a hamstring deal. And then through the course of his uh, rehab, which was right toward the end, he pulled his other hamstring. So I and injuries tend to mount as you get further into an NFL career. They don't the likelihood of one occurring doesn't lessen. And so I'm not willing to like I, I don't want to put all my chips behind uh, Woods, despite yeah. the fact that uh, like he's a great guy too. Will Mallory is fast. He was the fastest tight end in that position group in the combine last year. Colts took him with a fifth uh, a fifth round pick. I like him a lot, but he's not he's not a blocker. He's a pure receiver. Um, Granson is more a pure receiver. You, you've really got it, it seems like they're trying to aggregate all the players on the roster to cover all of the other's warts instead yeah. of just going out and getting one guy who can do it all. And you need that guy. Like you look at uh, the value of a Sam Laporta or, or obviously the value of a Kittle, the value of a Kelsey, the value of a Gronkowski. You got to have these guys. You want to win a championship. You need a tight end who can beat the security blanket for a quarterback who can block his ass off who is, is going to kind of set your culture for the receivers. And, and the Colts just don't have that guy unless Mallory develops into it. So I, I don't see that guy in the roster, which to me disqualifies them from any kind of championship banter, you know? And, and so you need a guy like Bowers. Well, uh, they have the draft capital to make a move. So it, it, has Ballard traded up every often? I can't imagine he has with his history. He's traded up in the second. In the second. Oh, so okay. he like he traded up to be able to get Jonathan Taylor. Okay. But trading up oh. in the first is that so works. punitive and, and so expensive for him that he's uh he's he's really not willing to take like he traded back when they traded Alec Pierce or they drafted Alec Pierce, they traded back to 53. He's way more likely to trade back than he is up because, like he says, and again. He's yeah. intractable about this. I love them picks. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because the Colts rank pretty high uh, for a team that uses 11 uh, personnel. Um, and they don't use the three tight ends very often. And you would look at the roster and think that that would be different. Just by looking at the roster, you go, right. look at all these tight ends they have. They, they must use all these guys. But no, they don't really. You know, they, like you said, they use them <laughs> one at a time. And it, you're in, then you're in, then you're out. So it's not like two or three guys like, hey, we have two tight ends. One guy can block, one guy can receive, and we're going to try. So it's kind of unusual that way, um, especially since they have so many of them on the team. Um, don't you think that that's unusual for a team that runs as many 11 personnel? You would think that they'd want, because there's, there's a three receiver group, but there's not much depth after the top three at wide receiver. And that's, that should be, if you run a lot of 11 personnel, like the Bengals, you want a, three top receivers like the Bengals have, but even the Bengals don't have much depth until they made the draft until they made the move last year to pick up a couple of guys. Cause they knew that they might lose a couple of guys. But how, what do you think about that? It is unusual, and there's a reason that it's unusual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and, and they have no depth whatsoever. Once Ashton Jul- uh, Doolin got hurt in camp last year, they had three wide receivers, and, and that was basically it. I mean, wow. if, if I had – I got to look at the, uh, at the depth chart to even know what their names are. Juwan yes. Winfrey – if he knocked on my door <laughs> yeah. and and said, "Hey, I'm Juwan Winfrey," I'd say, "Hey, how you doing? What can I do for you?" All yeah, right. I would not have any idea who that is, and I'm in the locker room every day. DJ Montgomery, I know a little bit more about, but this is not. That's a room that last year was three deep, and that's what made franchising like it, it, people are either pro or con the franchising of Michael Pittman Jr. 
because there are flaws in his game. The lack of top end speed sure. is kind of a big deal. But you want to go into a season or you want to go into a draft or free agency with Alec Pierce and Josh Downs being your only wide receivers? Yeah. Like, that's craziness. So you yeah. had to lock down Michael Pittman Jr. You were painted into that corner by your inability to value that piece of the puzzle like the Bengals do, you mentioned, and build the offensive line at the expense of what's on the exterior. You know, that's why you would believe, in, and when we went over the top five needs, you had receiver uh, as number three, and I could see that definitely being the case. And the only reason it's not one is because there's such a need to improve that uh, uh, that uh, DB room that it's just forget it. I mean, DB room first and foremost before we even think of anything else, but receivers right there on the doorstep waiting to chomp at number one or two uh, because, again, what happens if Pittman gets hurt? And then – Exactly. You can't do that. So, tooth decay is a really big deal. And brushing your teeth and flossing is really important. But if your house is burning, if your house is on fire, you forget about tooth decay, you forget about brushing and flossing, you get some water and you pour it on the fire. I, that's kind <laughs> of where the Colts are as far as the wide receiver need versus the secondary need. All right. Uh, why? Oh, excuse me. Let's talk about the offensive line because, wow, uh, went from being the healthiest line in football for a couple of years, one of the better lines in football for a couple of years. And all of a sudden it was like, wait, wait a second. No, nope, this line isn't very good anymore. What happened to the offensive line in Indianapolis? And you saw there were some injuries. There were some youth. And then this, and then all of a sudden, you mentioned the the, the coaching change. I'm sure had had a lot to do with that. I, why wouldn't it have uh, anything to do with it? But also, they they got healthy again, and the offensive line looked like the uh, the 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 the, uh, the solid unit of old. And I know it's not the same players, but that was definitely a big accomplishment for them that, uh, last season. You know, one guy who we can always count on in the locker room to tell us the truth is Ryan Kelly. Ryan Kelly's a really smart guy. He's a really honest guy. And, and we asked him about whether he was going to retire because like he's got family things. He's got two very, very young children who uh, were preemies. And, and so he's, they, he and his wife lost a child. And, and so his life, the priorities in his life ha have kind of been altered. And you would think that maybe after he's made his money that he would be thinking about doing something else. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm having way too much fun. This is great. Playing for Tony is awesome. You know, having Quentin, having uh, Braden, having these guys with me. Uh, you know, you've got Ryman who's coming on. There's no way I'm retiring now. I went that's through cool. the pain. Now it's time to yeah. pop. Yes. And, and you really feel like that's what this group is ready to do. And, and they, as a unit, with Tony Sperano Jr. as that coach, I think they have a hell of a chance to be one of the elite units. I think they were a top five offensive line this past year. Metrics will tell you that. I think they have a chance to be a top three, top two offensive line this year. And with Jonathan Taylor as a running back, with Anthony Richardson as a healthy quarterback, with the starting level receivers that they've got, if they add one more guy, yep. and who. If they, yes. if they, if you go get, like, if you can take care of free agency and, and get a quarterback, a couple of safeties, and I know that's like, this is a wish list, and that's what we do on, you know, in, in March. But if you can go into the draft with your primary needs being tight end and Bowers falls to you, and then at 46, you can get somebody who can be a wide out and, and stretch things and also be smooth in his cuts and that kind of thing. Man, set. I, I think you got a hell of a shot at having a really good offense. Yes. And and nowadays, it's not easy finding good offensive linemen. Everybody knows that. And if you yep. have one of those teams, it's a major luxury and you have to take advantage of it. Now, they went out and they used a fourth round pick on Freeland. So they uh -huh. do have some, hopefully, some youth depth out there. But Freeze is a guy that I'm sure is, you know, every, there's always that one lineman on the team, and he's usually a guard that, you know, uh, he you can you can do better than that. You can do better than that. But every year it's you can do better than that. So, but the guy just hangs on and he he makes the team and he does a serviceable job. But is that really just the only thing they have to do is maybe put in some guard depth along the line, maybe even late round draft pick kind of deal? That's it. And hopefully it's a late round draft pick. Hopefully the days 
of the Colts spending a sixth overall pick on a guard or over. Um, I think with Freeland, what you've got is you've got kind of a replay of what they did the year before with Ryman, where, yep. where Ryman comes in kind of an old rookie, but a guy who needed to bulk up a little bit, needed to learn technique and did. And last year really asserted himself as a top 10 left tackle. Uh, Freeland is a guy with great athleticism, great size, great length. He's got all the measurables. He just needed about 15 pounds. And I think this off season, he's going to add that 15 pounds, come back and be the depth piece that they need because right tackle like Braden Smith has trouble staying healthy. So if Freeland can come in and, and kind of be the placeholder while Braden gets well a couple of times next year, that could be a really functional group of guys. All right, let's uh, move on down to the defense uh, and take a look at what the team uh, is going to have to do here to get better in the off season. And uh, it's, we just talked about it. Uh, we've been talking about it all uh, video and that is the secondary. So um, there are a couple of free agents that's Blackman and Moore. So Moore should be resigned, but you believe Blackman will go. I think somebody's going to cover him. He is a okay. really, he, he's an elite level athlete. He's a really smart guy. Um, I like him a and I wish that the Colts could figure out a way to keep him and that he could stay healthy for 17 games. He missed the final two games, uh, this past year. And, and those hurt that, that was not, that was not ideal, especially against the Texans. Um, so I think somebody's going to come in and overpay kind of like what the Giants did with Bobby O'Karake. They're going to come in and just write a check that's bigger than the Colts were willing to. Okay. Uh, you can go get a box safety, and I think that the Colts will choose to do that. Nick Cross being the starting free safety, I just don't see as a tenable position. I, I think that you've got to move off of that, and you got to hire a guy, sign a guy who's going to be trusted back there to keep the lid on the defense and not give up what, what Cross did against Nico Collins in that regular season finale, where if the Colts win that game, they go to the playoffs, they lost that game, in large part because of that play and Nick Cross's bad play in that instance. And uh, so I think you move off of him. And then you've got like Jalen Jones, I don't think is a starting quality cornerback just from a, 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 a skill and measurable perspective. Um, so it, it, that's kind of where you are. Dallas Flowers, if he's healthy, he's okay. And, and then you got Juju Brents again, he's got to stay healthy. Uh, I'm not willing to go into camp. I wouldn't be if I was a GM uh, standing pat with those corners. Yeah, and if, I mean, if you're going to use a draft, you got to use a draft. But I would rather fill it with a free agent so I can attack the offense a little bit. Yeah, it, it would be too, way too dangerous, especially with free agency coming first. It would be way too dangerous to not make sure that you have most yeah. of your secondary taken care of before the draft. Because that's that's inarguable. Like you have to upgrade the secondary. Yeah. So you're exactly right. If you don't at least address it at a mediocre level in free agency, what are you doing? Yeah. And one of the things that Ballard's really good at, Ned Dodds and Morocco Brown, those guys will will peek into, you know, they will go to rummage sales and find the piece that's on at Antiques Roadshow and values at like 7,000 times what they paid for it. They'll get the $30 vase that's worth $30,000. Yeah. You know what I mean? Every once in a while, they'll find those guys. So I, I trust is a big word, but I think that those guys are capable maybe of lifting that position group before you get to the draft. Well, I mean, just take a look at the, 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 where these guys came from. I mean, Flowers, free agent, Lamage, free agent, um, Baker, free agent, Scott, fifth round, Thomas and Jones, seventh round. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's no surprise that they have to upgrade the talent there. So. And we, we've got we've got people around town who are talking about Daniel Scott, like, oh, Daniel Scott's going to be the guy. Daniel Scott wasn't on the field last year. How the yeah. hell do we know what Daniel Scott's going to be? Stop projecting people yes. that are complete unknowns into a position of value. It's ridiculous. What happened to him last year? He got hurt. And I think it was even before camp. I think it was in mini camp. 
he got hurt and all of a sudden he wasn't there. I, the specificity of the injury, I'm not sure whether it was ever shared to tell you the truth. Just kind of forgotten. You know, yeah. it happens, especially oh, when. Guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about, well, this is basically a four, two, five defense. So there's, you got the two linebackers who um, look like they did a pretty serviceable job. You got EJ speed. You got Zaire Franklin, Zaire Franklin, a very underrated player led the team with 179 tackles and speed, uh, 102 tackles, 12 tackles for loss. Seems to be, uh, um, you know, a player that uh, can uh, defend the run pretty well. Um, so are they kind of just set there again? It's not a major position that they have to worry about with only two that play most of the time, but, uh, they're just going to go out there again with speed and Franklin and, and, and that's about it. And maybe just, uh, add some, uh, some depth, some late round or free agent depth. Yeah. I think that that's kind of where they are. And I, I think that those guys like this, the, he's at the very high end of what I'm going to say. But Zaire Franklin is a guy who made tackles that people have to make. You know what I mean? They're not game-changing plays. Somebody's got to make a tackle or a guy's going to score. Zaire Franklin is better than that, but he's a seventh-round draft pick. He doesn't have great speed. He's not great in coverage. And and so there are warts with him, but he is a great dude and a great leader in the room and a great leader for the defense, and that he can't get around as well as other guys, I think he compensates for that by being the kind of man that he is. And and, But, uh, I mean, you can see it, and you're talking about it, and and you've got the numbers on the screen, where Zaire was a seventh rounder out of uh, Syracuse. EJ Speed was a fifth rounder, and I really like EJ Speed. And they kept putting – this is one thing that I'll fault – Ballard for is he will trust that a player will um, resume his career where it was before. Like he did this last year with Shaq Leonard. Shaq Leonard couldn't play dead. And they kept putting him on the field the year before until he got his face uh, smashed and bloodied. Like he couldn't move. Okay. They put him out there anyway. Last year, they put him out there. They had him start and he couldn't play. And, and any time EJ Speed came into the game, that defense took a step up. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, they move away from Shaq Leonard, but it took so long for them to figure out the guy couldn't move anymore. EJ Speed can move. EJ Speed can play. I like EJ Speed. I think he's huh. – I for being a fifth-round pedigree type guy from a small college, I think he's terrific. All right. And then we look at the defensive line and uh, we're talking, of course, about Stewart being, uh, uh, you know, a big uh, free agent. By the way, he was suspended last year. Yeah. Um, Okay. So and uh, is that just one of those things and not concerned with anything like that uh, in the future? And he he didn't have anything like that prior to that suspension. He did not. But but it was his contract year. And he looked, I got to tell you, walking into the locker room, first time I saw him, I was like, oh. What did Grover do? You know, it looked as like, okay, contract <laughs> here. Must have got into the weight room and, and oh, really yeah. kind of built him. He was kind of – he was more tapered than he'd been. Like, he looked great. And then we found out why, and he got yeah. the six-game rip. And and the lack of depth at the tackle position really kind of betrayed uh, the Colts. Tavin Bryan is not a guy you want to trust as a starter. Eric Johnson, certainly not a guy you want to trust as a starter. And so Grover going down really put that team behind the eight ball as far as stopping the run. He's the guy. He can stop the run. DeForest Buckner can go get the quarterback a little bit. Without Stewart, you really kind of mitigated the value that Buckner has to you. It, it, that group really needs to function as a unit. And, and without Grover, they didn't. Uh, how did the rookie do, the fourth-round pick? He didn't get uh, – He it looked like, you know, he was a typical rookie. The – oh, oh, Tommy. Uh, uh, is, nobody that, can, is that what they call him, Tommy? Okay. That, yeah, that, it's unpronounceable, so everybody calls yeah. him Tommy. I like it. He's really fast, but I don't think he's big enough. He, he's kind of a – he's an oddly talented guy, and he's a really smart guy from Northwestern. And, and so he can run, he can move, he is relentless in his pursuit – but he's just kind of an odd fitting widget. Yeah. 
like from a from a measurable standpoint, yeah. he's got things that you would love to have, but he doesn't have things that you would have to have, and and so he's kind of that guy. But he's I was a classic wondering. tweener. Yeah, yeah, like a weird guy, and uh, I don't blame Ballard for taking a shot on him in the fourth. Oh yeah, it, sure. You got a guy with that kind of speed and that kind yeah. of relentless behavior toward the football. I'm all good with that. Yeah, matter of fact, Dave Syverson, our lead scout, when we were talking about uh, the draft last year, that's one of his, that was one of his sleepers, a guy to keep an eye on. He really likes yeah. him, so um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what kind of a uh, because they either way, even if they resign Stewart, as we were talking before, you would think that the team will definitely at some point, either through free agency or the draft, add another defensive tackle. Yes, yeah, they, they, uh, that's like. You know, um, me going to the Target. I'm going to wind up in the electronics department at some point, yeah. and I'm going to buy something stupid. Yeah. You know, Chris Ballard is that way with defensive tackles. <laughs> okay. Uh, also up front, you got the three defensive linemen, the edged guys, who, statistically speaking, uh, eight sacks or more between the three of them. Um, uh, so it, it, on paper, oh, they're fine. They don't need any more edge rushers. But as again, we were talking on the other uh, video. Fact is, uh, they have to look at the future, and and that's why we might see another edge rusher added at some point. And if you've got a guy, I mean, if you grade a guy like Chop Robinson, as as maybe, and this is a real stretch, but if you look at him and kind of because of his pedigree at Penn State and his speed, you say, okay, maybe he can be kind of a Micah Parsons light. You know what? It wouldn't surprise me to see Ballard trade back and go get that guy and and continue to bolster the defense because the defense, in terms of points allowed last year, 28th in the NFL, the offense was 11th. And, and if you look, you look at the teams that have a high-ranking defense, offense too to an extent, but the top four teams in terms of points against on the defensive side of the ball are uh, Baltimore, San Francisco, and this is not in any particular order, but Baltimore, San Francisco, Kansas City, and um, uh, oh shoot, the uh, uh, anyway, they're really good, and, and oh yeah, Kansas City, San Francisco, Baltimore, it damn it. Anyway, You'll get those it. teams really, really good among the four. Oh, Baltimore, among the best teams in the NFL, you could argue. Oh, they're Cleveland, the best is it Cleveland? Teams. NFL. Well, it's it's Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco. I, I know Cleveland was really good defensively yeah, last year. But. They were, and and so you, you know you look at those, and you, oh, I think Buffalo actually. You you look at those and you say, okay, from twenty eighth, we got a long way to go to get competitive. Sure. Yeah. It, offensively, you're eleventh. So are you really going to use your first two draft picks, fifteen and forty six, bolstering an offense? That's yeah. already relatively capable when you've got Jonathan Taylor going to be back for 17 games, you hope, and Anthony Richardson back. You, you're getting lift already for an offense that's competent. Yeah. Defense, you got to go get. And and if you want, if you want your back end to shine, putting pressure on the quarterback is a great way to get that done. Yeah, I, I think unless something like dramatically great happens for the Colts and Bowers is available. Uh, I can easily see them going defense first, and then they could go receiver either second round or third round because, again, as we talked about, it's a deep group of receivers. Right. And you can just wait until then to get one. So, um, okay, so then uh, overall, by the way, the free agents uh, that are uh, on defense, uh, we, we talked about Kenny Moore, of course, and Stewart, but Lewis is also a free agent. Uh, we talked about Blackman as well. I guess Lewis he, he, and Brian uh, – Harrison's there as well, but Lewis, do you think he's back? I do. I, I like Taekwon. And, and Taekwon's a guy, and he's a he's kind of a quitty pay light where you can move him around and he, okay. he's good in run support and, and he's good at getting to the quarterback in in the right situation. And and Taekwon is a guy, he's a veteran. He, he's a guy who's a second round pick back in the, I think six years ago. And, and so Taekwon Lewis is a guy when healthy, and he was healthy all last year, no injuries last year, which was great. 
he can be exactly the kind of depth piece that Chris Ballard likes. What he wants, Chris Ballard's dream, is to have eight starting defensive linemen. Yep. He wants he wants guys he can shuffle in and out right. and keep keep them fresh to the end of the game. Everybody wants it. Who wouldn't want that? But he really wants it. And Taekwon Lewis is a part of that puzzle. I, I think Taekwon – and you're not going to have to pay him a gob. I don't think anybody's going to come in and offer Taekwon Lewis $10 million a year to play football. Yeah. So I, I think that you can keep him at, at a salary level you feel good about and know exactly the kind of human being you're going to have in that locker room and on the field. And if they do that, then that means they really only have to add uh, one, maybe two other defensive linemen, and that's it. And then you've got, no. especially, obviously, if you sign your guys like uh, Lewis and and uh, Stewart. Okay, it so does, it does kind of depend on how Titus Leo is projected. Titus Leo is really an interesting guy. Okay, he's fast. He looks good. I mean, you you look at him or you stand next to him during camp, and you're like, holy hell, who is that guy? Like, he looks like somebody. You know what I mean? Just okay. the way the jersey hangs, the way the pads are. You're like, damn, that guy's got to be able to play football. And and so if he takes a jump up in year two, okay. uh, maybe he makes Taekwon Lewis a little less relevant. Interesting. Got that one. All right. Uh, special teams. Uh, uh, you've got your kick return as a free agent and your punter as a free agent. So the Colts need to uh, figure out what to do there. Uh, will they re-sign both? They're going to re-sign Rigoberto Sanchez. Like Sanchez, they like, and and they have good reason to like him. He is an absolutely reliable holder as well as he is a punter. And, and he's a great dude. And, and that group really works well together, Matt Gay and Sanchez, just like it did with, with Vinatieri too. And, and Luke Rhodes is a long snapper. Those guys, they love each other. They're great at what they do. I think that's an area of strength for the Colts, the punt unit. And so Sanchez is going to be back. Isaiah McKenzie was uh, suspended at the end of the year, and his his locker was gone. Like, usually, when Grover Stewart was suspended for PEDs, you still had the name placard over the top yeah. of the locker, and his stuff was still in it. Isaiah McKenzie and the other guy, and I'm spacing who it was, um, when they ran afoul of some team rule toward the end of the season, it was like all evidence of Isaiah McKenzie was scrubbed from the locker room. He had just gone. I don't think Isaiah McKenzie is going to be back. Okay. And that was a suspension. Like not That wasn't like PEDs or anything. That was like he broke a rule or something. Yeah. Their okay. team rules were broken, and we have no idea which. The Colts are really good at not leaking that kind of information. So it's just – it's all supposition. I don't know what they did, but they did something. All right. And uh, I also – you mentioned Mo Alley Cox as a potential cap casualty. Are there yeah. any others that uh, we might need to keep an eye on who could be let go? Not really. I mean, they can they can kind of reconfigure Ryan Kelly's contract, uh, but Mo Ali Cox is kind of that guy. Ashton Doolin, uh, they I th I think he's signed at like four and a half, just over four million, and uh, the dead cap money's one. So if he doesn't project as being healthy, then uh, he was injured the entirety of last year then I, I think they move on from him. But I think they think that he's going to be healthy and they like the way he contributes on special teams. you got to be versatile if you're going to play on a Chris Ballard roster, and Doolin is. Kent, uh, I really appreciate it as always. Uh, of course, I enjoyed uh, our first year together in our, in our new Dynasty League. That was a lot of fun. Speaking of drafting, we have to draft our first our first real rookie draft is uh, coming up. So uh, excited about that. Uh, that'll come at some point after the draft. Uh, so can't wait to do that. And hopefully we'll talk again. I know we will sometime between now uh, and training camp. And maybe we could do it a couple times because once free agency and the draft is over, there might be a lot to talk about too. And I'm, I'm assuming there will be a lot to talk about because uh, – uh, it sounds like Ballard uh, has, uh, you know, speaking of the hot seat, the proverbial hot seat, he seems yeah. to be on it. So we would expect a lot of movement uh, this offseason for the Colts. And again, we want to remind everybody, we'll have a link in the description area for uh, your, your two YouTube channels. 
So you have, of course, the Ken Sterling YouTube channel and the Two Big Brains YouTube channel. So. We got big heads. Dan Dockich and I got the giant melons. And uh, so that, that name was just like, well, you know, if we're going to describe what this is, we got two huge heads. And let, let's go with that. And it's going to be a very busy few weeks for you guys on that channel, too, because sure. of college basketball, uh, sure. which takes uh, precedent uh, around the nation. This is March. So a lot going on there. So I'm uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun there with the Hoosier fans. Uh, Kent, again, appreciate it. We'll talk to you again, hopefully real soon. My pleasure. I, you do a great job, and I really enjoy it because it's kind of like, it's like, okay, we got free agency coming. We got the draft com coming. How much do I know? What's Greg going to ask me? And so it forces me kind of into a, a study mode to prepare me for this offseason. I appreciate your work. You got it. Thank you very much. Very kind words. I appreciate that as well. Thanks, Kent.